Hello, my name is Rahul, and I'm currently doing my fellowship in pediatric critical care medicine. I'm also a very passionate educator, helping students just like you prepare for and excel on the USMLE exam. I wanted to do a very special video highlighting a high yield USMLE step one concept, and that is lymph node drainage. Now I'm all about integration, and I think that this video is going to really link anatomy and immunology. I'm just in the process of adding my full set of USMLE Step 1 immunology videos to my Step 1 pass-fail course. So if you'd like to check it out and see if this pass-fail course is right for your preparation, I actually added the link to the description. Without any further ado, here is our video today, Step 1 Lymph Node Drainage. All right, so going into another test-taking strategy, we got to talk about how do you recognize oncological lesions on the USMLE. Now, we talked about maybe there could be lymphadenopathy, but you also want to understand and integrate constitutional symptoms. So what are some constitutional symptoms? Go ahead and put one of them in the chat. What are some constitutional symptoms they can give you? Excellent. Weight loss, B symptoms, fever. Wonderful. So these patients can have fatigue weight loss, and fevers. And remember that this could all be due to increased TNF-alpha. What you also have to understand is that malignant tumors may have invasion of local structures. And so maybe they have compression of the airway. Think about your uh, superior sulcus tumor causing you to have SVC syndrome, okay? So always think about these concepts because then it frames into what organ system and then bam, goes into the specific type of neoplasia. And so here are the features of neoplasia on the USMLE, and I want you to focus on the fact that, okay, neoplasia can cause obstruction, and that could be of major structures like the airway or the digestive system, as well as general symptoms, which is the cachexia and this loss of well-being, the constitutional symptoms. And so as we go closer and closer into the lymph node destruction, uh, uh, discussion, excuse me, we need to make a mental model for this next section, and that is the lymphatic drainage. What I'm going to do is in this section, I'm going to take a cancer, for example, or an infection. I'm going to jump into the normal lymph node anatomy. And then we're going to build a model for where it drains into. Okay. So start with the actual pathology, and then do the anatomy. Don't start memorizing all of the lymphatics and then go into pathology. I like to start with the high yield and then go backwards. Let's go through some anatomy integrations here. Let's start with our first question. A patient is admitted to the ICU after cardiac surgery. The patient is noted on post-op day two to have a pleural effusion. So he had some mediastinal surgery and now has a pleural effusion. Lab analysis characterizes it as increased LDH, increased protein, and a high triglyceride within the sample. I want to first pause and review something from our prior videos, and that is talking whether or not this patient has transudative or an exudative effusion. Go ahead and put that in the chat. Is it transudative or is it exudative? Excellent. If you're saying exudative, you're absolutely correct. And this patient after cardiac surgery, watch for chylothorax. Now, what is the mechanism? The cardiac surgery caused a disruption in the thoracic duct. And remember, the thoracic duct is going to be the area where all of your uh, chyle fluid, as well as lymphatics, are going to drain. Now, what is the thoracic duct? It is going to drain the whole lymphatic system in the body, except the right upper extremity. And I'll show you a picture coming up but it's going to drain majority of the body. Now, the lymphatics are then dumped into the venous circulation. And once they are in the venous circulation, they go back to the heart and then they circulate everywhere. So where is the junction at which the lymphatics are going to drop, i.e. where's the junction where the thoracic duct empties into the venous system? The USMA loves for you to know that that is at the junction of the left subclavian and left internal jugular. That is where the lymphatic system is going to gain access to the venous system. Now, prior to the thoracic duct, 
there is a dilation of lymphatic channels. What is this anatomical structure? And this structure is going to be the cisterna chyle. That is going to be a area of big dilation right uh, before the thoracic duct empties into the left subclavian and left internal jugular. So as you can see, majority of the body is going to be drained by the thoracic duct. Here is going to be your cisterna chyle, which is that dilation. And the thoracic duct is going to insert right at that juncture of the left internal jugular and the left subclavian. Remember that majority of the right upper extremity, that is going to be drained by the right lymphatic duct. Disruptions in the thoracic duct or lymphatic ducts equals pleural effusions on your USMLE that are going to be very chyle, chylomicron or triglyceride or lymphatic rich. So here's some integrations. Going into a little bit of biochemistry, make sure you check that, those videos out. Remember that chylomicrons are lipid rich and they enter the circulation via the thoracic duct. Tumors can also spread via lymphatics. The specific tumors that spread via lymphatics are going to be your carcinomas. Carcinomas usually spread via the lymphatic system. However, there are some exceptions and the USMLE loves to go for this. There are some carcinomas that actually spread via the hematogenous route. In general, remember carcinomas are going to spread via the lymphatic route, but these are the exceptions. Follicular thyroid carcinomas, choriocarcinomas, renal cell carcinoma, watch for invasion of the renal vessels, and you could even get bilateral varicoceles, and then hepatocellular carcinoma. These are all going to be carcinomas that rather than lymphatic spread, they have more hematogenous spread. Our next section is going to be talking about lymph node and its drainage. I'm just going to go into what's pertinent for the USMLA. And the way that I like to break it down is in, on your physical exam, they may put in the vignette lymph nodes that you can palpate and what are the associations and the specific drainage pattern. They may also put in the lab section, these deep lymph nodes and these deep lymph nodes, they may put, Hey, on CT scan, you see mediastinal lymph lymphadenopathy. So what we're going to do is we're going to be breaking down lymph nodes, integrating anatomy using this mental model. So the ones that are important for uh, your exam that you can actually palpate are the submandibular, the retro auricular behind the ears, posterior occipital, the deep cervical, vercal node, which is the supraclavicular, and then the axillary or anterior pectoral nodes. The deeper lymph nodes, again, you can't palpate these. These are going to be on imaging, gonadal drainage, the rectal drainage, and the mediastinal lymph nodes. So let's go through the first one. We're going to use a pathology, and then we're going to be jumping into the normal anatomy. Let's start with this question. A patient is a smoker and drinker, presents with a white patch on the side of his mouth. So you notice here, chronic irritation states. This is unchanged with tongue depressor scraping, which means that it's not going to be candida, for example. A biopsy shows cellular dysplasia. This precursor lesion may lead to which oncological pathology? The precursor lesion here is going to be leukoplakia. And leukoplakia can lead to squamous cell carcinoma of the mouth. The risk factor here is smoking. Now, erythroplakia is going to uh, be important for us to integrate here because erythroplakia just is leukoplakia with angiogenesis. And that means that, oh man, that is more cancerous because you have increased amounts of VEGF that is going to bring you blood vessels in that area. So here is that leukoplakia and here is the erythroplakia. So the concept that I want you to note here is that chronic irritation relates hyperplasia of, or leads to hyperplasia of oral mucosa, and then you get dysplasia and carcinoma. And carcinoma is characterized by increased VEGF in the 
uh, uh, angiogenesis uh, integration, which we talked about with erythroplakia. And then anytime on exam questions, they see high nuclear to cytosol ratio, high N to C ratio, I think about neoplasia. All right, so where does squamous cell carcinoma of the mouth go to? Well, it goes to the submandibular lymph nodes. And I would go ahead and encourage you to palpate those uh, right on, on yourself so that it sticks a little bit more. All right, let's go through this vignette. A 15 year old football player with malaise, sore throat and fever. His pharyngeal exam is shown. So this is a gross pathology sewing exudates on the tonsils. Abdominal exam is notable for fullness and a palpable mass four centimeters below the left costal margin. Do your regional anatomic localization. His strep rapid is going to be negative. What is the likely diagnosis? Go ahead and type that into the chat. What is the diagnosis here? A vignette we've already gone through, but I think is important for us to uh, consider. Just a little bit of space repetition here. Excellent. When you're thinking about mononucleosis, boom, mononucleosis due to EBV. So anytime I see a microbiological agent, I always like to integrate, i.e. in a micro learning fashion, I like to integrate what is the structural morphology or the high yield lab test related to, let's say, for example, a bacteria. EBV is going to be a double stranded DNA virus, and it is going to infect B cells and i.e. it's going to infect CD21 positive B cells. And that's so important for us to note. Now, what lymph nodes do patients with this exudative tonsillitis, as you can see in the back of the pharynx, these tonsils have pus on them. What lymph nodes do these patients drain to? And that is going to also be the submandibular. So remember that this question could have also been a group A strep question or strep throat question. And these patients are going to drain to the submandibular lymph nodes as well. Now, there are multiple EBV integrations for the USMLA. There are certain cancers in particular that stain EBV positive, and you need to go through these uh, step by step. Number one is going to be nasopharyngeal carcinoma. This is going to be primarily in Chinese American uh, males. Oral hairy leukoplakia, especially in immunocompromised uh, patients, they're going to have that shaggy white patches on the sides of the tongue. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, specifically, you're going to be thinking of Burkitt's lymphoma. Remember that uh, presents as a jaw mass in the African variant, 814 translocation, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and CNS lymphoma, which is going to be this ring-enhancing uh, uh, lesion, especially in an immunocompromised patient. So what are the other pathologies to think of when you have exudative pharyngitis or tonsillitis on the USMLE? Well, CMV, very closely related to EBV, but CMV is going to not be in immunocompetent patients, more immunocompromised patients. Adenovirus, that can also cause pus on the tonsils, exudative pharyngitis. And remember that adenovirus specifically can cause this pharyngeal conjunctivitis syndrome, in which you have an exudative pharyngitis, but you also have a red eye in your USMLA question. Patients with group A strep, obviously you uh, are going to integrate that with pus on the tonsils, but I would also encourage you to watch for rheumatic fever presentation with the Jones criteria. And then diphtheria, this is going to be a patient who is going to be unimmunized on your USMLE, and they are going to have these leathery tonsils and this bull neck. And patients with diphtheria, they can also have airway compression. So very important for you to note. All right, the next one we are going to be talking about is rubella. Now, rubella gives you the posterior auricular lymphadenopathy. Let's go through some questions related to rubella. What is the morphology of this virus? This virus is going to be a toga virus, and it is going to be an envelope, single-strand, positive mRNA virus. Let's go through this question. A pregnant mother who works in a daycare is exposed to an unimmunized child who was diagnosed with rubella. Labs show that the mother is rubella non-immune, so she's not protected. 
what are likely complications on the offspring? So congenital rubella, we're going to be thinking about deafness, cataracts, and PDA. How do they test this on the USMLE? Well, they can say failed the hearing screen. They can say abnormal white light reflex, which relates to a shining a light into the newborn's eyes and you see white, not red. You've got to be thinking of cataracts. You also have to be thinking of retinoblastoma. PDA, which is going to be this to and fro rumbling holosystolic murmur. What are some other high yield pathologies on the USMLE that can give you cataracts? Well, believe it or not, myotonic dystrophy can, galactosemia due to increased amounts of sorbitol, diabetes mellitus, neurofibromatosis too, and then you can have lens ectopia and cataracts related to Marfan syndrome. Speaking of the lens ectopia, remember that Marfan syndrome, the lens are actually going to dislocate medial, or excuse me, lateral and out. Whereas in homocystinuria, the lens are going to go medial and towards the nose. A patient presents with itchiness of the scalp. Hair exam is going to be shown. The patient is noted to have a circular patch of hair loss with associated scaling of the skin. Biopsy of that area shows septate hyphae on KOH preparation. What is the likely lymph adenopathy pattern, which may also be seen on physical exam? This patient is going to have a loss of hair, and it's going to have still some hair shafts intact. It is going to be related to your tinea capitis. And in tinea capitis, you are going to have suboccipital or what we call posterior occipital lymphadenopathy right in the back. Now, we typically use oral griseofulvin or oral terbenafine for treatment of tinea capitis. What is the mechanism of action of griseofulvin? This is an integration from and a recall from our prior videos. And that is going to be, it is a microtubule inhibitor. It also is going to be a CYP-P450 inducer. Griseofulvin, the way I remember it, is greasy hair, i.e. griseofulvin you use for tinea capitis. So tinea capitis, you're going to be thinking about posterior occipital lymphadenopathy. Let's go ahead and integrate the CYP P450 inducers. Before we do that, I want to ask, are you guys learning something? Go ahead and type in yes into the chat box. Just to make sure y'all are listening. Excellent. Very proud of each and every one of you. Hang in there. We're integrating. We're going in concepts, coming out of concepts, et cetera. All right, here we go. CYP450 inhibitors, or excuse me, CYP450 inducers. Where did we get into this mess? Well, we got it with griseofulvin. Now, this is the mnemonic that I like to use. PBRs, Guinness, and Coronas induce chronic alcoholism. So these are your CYP P450 inducers. PBRs, phenytoin, barbiturates, rifampin, St. John's warts, which we use for depression. Griseofulvin. Coronas is carbamazepine, and then chronic alcoholism. This is the first step of your learning, is just basically going through and knowing this mnemonic and knowing the P450 inducers. But the next stage, if you're in an advanced stage, is going to be understanding the mechanisms of action of each of these. So let's go through this. PBRs, Guinness, and Coronas induce chronic alcoholism. Now, this is the point where I'm going to make it a little bit more fun and lively. And I want to ask you, for those of you who uh, do drink alcoholic beverages, which one would you prefer? Go ahead and put that into the chat box. Okay, we got some Coronas. Excellent. Some Guinness. All right, Corona with a lime. Excellent. All right, great. It's just to know your personal uh, preference. All right, very good. So just as a test-taking strategy, what I uh, want to do is I want to give you a unique way to recognize pharmacology questions. 
And in the vignette, whenever they give you three or more medications in the patient's past medical history, you want to be thinking about a couple things. Number one, are they testing me on the side effect of a drug? Because what they're really testing you on is can you as a student take this whole list of medications I gave you and relate it to the chief complaint, why the patient is coming in? And then the second one that you want to be thinking about is a SIP interaction. For example, a SIP inducer that is going to be in the uh, medication list, and they're going to test it in the setting of warfarin, in which if you have SIP induction with warfarin, your warfarin is not going uh, to be working as well. What is the likely next best step in management? A child presents with fever. He is noted to have temperatures up to 102 for the past week. He has had fussiness and emesis. Mother notes that both eyes have been red. There's no discharge or trauma to the eye. Exam shows erythema of lips and swelling of the bilateral hands. A little bit more of a step 2CK question, but I want to incorporate it here. What is the likely next best step in management? A, chest x-ray, B, echocardiogram, C, PET scan, or D, ultrasound of the abdomen. Excellent. If you're thinking about echocardiogram, you're absolutely correct. Remember that this patient had fever and then multi-organ involvement. Anytime I see fever and multi-organ involvement, I think of a systemic pathology or a syndrome. And this is going to be classically Kawasaki syndrome. And in Kawasaki's disease, we are going to be worried about coronary artery aneurysms, and you can assess those with an echocardiogram. So let's go through a test-taking strategy with Kawasaki. Anytime you have greater than five days of fever, in this case, he had fevers for a week, please think about Kawasaki disease. Pay respects to Kawasaki disease. You also want to integrate multi-organ involvement. So here's a math equation, fever times five days plus greater than or equal to four of the following. I like to use the mnemonic crash. Conjunctivitis, in which you have a non-exudative conjunctivitis, that is going to uh, be different than, for example, a uh, conjunctivitis due to a bacterial or viral uh, entity. A rash that is erythematous and diffuse throughout the body, it is amorphous. Adenopathy, this is the deep cervical lymph node that's on the side of the neck. A strawberry tongue, which represents the fact that there's acute inflammation and mucositis, and then hand or extremity changes, which presents as swollen extremities. Kawasaki disease is one of the differentials for strawberry tongue. Let's go through another few differentials for strawberry tongue on your exam. Scarlet fever, that is going to be due to strep infections. Kawasaki disease, other strawberry-like substances or uh, integrations, Remember your inflamed strawberry cervix with trichomonas. And then remember the strawberry hemangioma. And this is a benign vascular lesion that questions go for in a uh, anticipatory guidance way. Uh, essentially, the correct answer with strawberry hemangiomas, even though they can uh, uh, be quite large, is that strawberry hemangiomas are going to grow and then they're going to regress spontaneously. And that can uh, frequently be tested. A 54-year-old Japanese-American man presents to the clinic complaining of a gnawing epigastric pain. Upon taking a complete history, you learn that he has lost over 20 pounds, constitutional symptoms, and he has been vomiting after meals. The pain has not been relieved using over-the-counter antacids, so it's not GERD. On physical exam, you note supraclavicular lymph node, swelling and darkened, thickened skin in the flexural areas of the patient's arms and legs. What is the likely diagnosis here? 
Yet again, this could be a systemic pathology. And what I'm going for here is gastric adenocarcinoma. Now, gastric adenocarcinoma, the skin finding that you can see here is the fact that the patient has this thickened skin in the flexural areas. They're going for acanthosis nigricans. Patients may also have, in your exam questions, multiple subarea keratosis. And this is a derm tie-in. And this is what we call lesser trelot sign. Now, these are known as these waxy, brown, stuck-on lesions, subarea keratosis. So gastric adenocarcinoma, the integration that I wanted to make from an anatomy standpoint is the fact that it drains to the supraclavicular lymph node the left supraclavicular lymph node, that's going to be known as that Verkhaus node, and you can palpate that. Skin manifestations, this is going to be a subarea keratosis that is going to uh, be related to the lesser trelot sign, and then this is acanthosis nigricans. Now, what are some other pathologies that can give you acanthosis nigricans? Very high yield. Hyperinsulinism or specifically insulin resistance. And you can see this in patients who are obese with metabolic syndrome. And they usually say that this is a velvety uh, thickened area of skin in the creases. What is the most likely diagnosis? A female with history of breast cancer diagnosed via sentinel node biopsy presents for a follow-up appointment. The patient was noted to have a radical mastectomy over a decade ago. She is noted to have no recurrence. Exam of the left arm is notable for asymmetric pitting edema. What is the most likely diagnosis? Excellent. If you are thinking that the patient had breast cancer and then they had a resection, and remember, breast cancer is going to migrate to the uh, axillary area. You had disruption of the lymphatics system due to the radical mastectomy. That can lead you to chronic lymph insufficiency and edema essentially. And that's going to be lymph edema. Now, if you have chronic lymphedema, you're going to be thinking of that being a precursor lesion to angiosarcoma. And that can be classically tested as well. What other genetic syndrome is going to be related to lymphedema and that swelling? Turner syndrome. So let's go ahead and do a quick summary. Submandibular, we talked about squamous cell carcinoma of the oral cavity, exudative tonsillitis, retroauricular, think about your rubella, posterior occipital, tinea capitis, deep cervical, Kawasaki disease, left supraclavicular, gastric adenocarcinoma, and then axillary, think about breast cancer. Ladies and gentlemen, those are going to be the high yield lymph nodes that you can palpate that are commonly tested on the USMLE. Let's go into the next section, which is going to be talking about deep lymph nodes. First, I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna ask you to just take a deep breath. Go ahead, let's do it together. It's not silly, it's gonna work. All right. Let's start with deep lymph nodes. Again, these on your exam questions, they're going to give you a CT scan. Let's start with this question. Which of the following structures made this mass metastasize to? 23-year-old male presents with lower abdominal pain. He was embarrassed to go to the physician after he noted a few months ago had fullness in his testicles. Ultrasound of the testes is ordered. Doppler shows normal blood flow to the testicles. So it's not going to be testicular torsion. 
but ultrasound does note a homogeneous mass on the left testes. Orchiectomy is scheduled. CT of the abdomen and pelvis is ordered for TNM staging. Remember, tumor, nodal involvement, metastasis for this presumed testicular tumor. Which of the following structures made this mass metastasized to? So testicular tumors are going to typically metastasize to the para-aortic lymph nodes. I also want to give you a test sticking strategy here. And that is that when you think about lower abdominal pain, don't just think about bladder, but anytime a patient presents with lower abdominal pain, think about the GU organs as well. Let's go through some hyal lymphatic drainage. The testicles are going to drain into the para-aortic lymph nodes. I always think of it like two testicles and just bring them up right next to para-aortic. So ovarian cancer and testicular cancer, i.e. gonads, are going to drain into the lymph nodes that are right next to the aorta, the para-aortic lymph nodes. And remember that the para-aortic lymph nodes actually drain into that dilation, which is going to be the cisterna chile. Now, what about if they gave you a question related to scrotal tumors? Now, scrotal tumors, they're unique because scrotal tumors are going to drain into the superficial inguinal lymph nodes. And scrotal tumors drain into the superficial inguinal lymph nodes, and those superficial inguinal lymph nodes are going to drain into the deep inguinal lymph nodes, then the external iliac lymph nodes, then the common iliac lymph nodes, para-aortic, and cisterna chile. So build this model that whenever you have the external and internal iliac, they are going to drain into the common, then para-aortic, then cisterna chile. What other pathologies or areas are going to drain into the superficial inguinal area? Well, the lower two thirds of the vagina. Remember that the distal vagina, just tying in some embryology, is going to be not Mullerian, but derived from urogenital sinus. Also, the rectum below the dentate line. Remember, below the dentate line, it's more ectoderm. So it's going to be ectoderm, superficial inguinal. It's on the outside, superficial. The rectum above the dentate line, that's going to be the internal iliac. Think about internal structures, rectum, prostate, they're inside. So they are going to be draining into the internal iliac. Maybe you have a question on prostatitis. They'll ask you, where is it going to drain into? Internal iliac. Now watch this. The internal iliac is going to drain into the common iliac, then the para aortic, and then the cisterna chile, and then the thoracic duct. I'm marching along the blood vessels, i.e., or excuse me, I'm marching along the lymph nodes. The upper one-third of the vagina, remember that the upper one-third of the vagina as an embryology time, that's Mullerian-derived. Also, the cervix is going to be Mullerian-derived. Remember, Mullerian on your exam can also be paramesonephric. The lymph node drainage there, well, that's going to be the external iliac. The external iliac, you are going to be draining into the common iliac, the periaortic, and then the cisterna chile. So what is a high yield integration here? Well, it is that dentate line. Remember that when you're talking about above the dentate line, that is the internal iliac. Think about internal structures. Whereas below the dentate line, that's a more superficial ectodermal structure, and that is going to be your superficial inguinal. That compare and contrast is frequently tested. Let's apply this concept. Which of the following lymph node groups would the scrotal inflammation directly drain into? After a razor injury, a 18-year-old male presents with scrotal pain. Here's your signs of acute inflammation. The patient has fever up to 38.6, and exam shows erythema of the scrotum with associated warmth. Trans illumination is negative, so it's not a hydrocele. And cremasteric reflex is intact, so it's not testicular torsion. Which of the following lymph nodes 
would the scrotal inflammation directly drain into? What do you think is the answer here? Excellent. Very good. Superficial inguinal. Let's go ahead and build on this mental model by introducing this picture. This picture is very unique because it has the cisterna chile, which is going to be right here. And that cisterna chile drains into the thoracic duct. Now, here is going to be where you have the paraaortic lymph nodes. This area right here, this is going to be the common iliac lymph nodes. Remember that the common iliac lymph nodes get drainage from your external and internal iliac lymph nodes. And then you have your superficial and your deep lymph nodes. So let's go ahead and go through this step-by-step. -step. The superficial inguinal and deep inguinal lymph nodes, they are going to drain into the external iliac lymph nodes. So the pattern in black is gonna be like this, okay? The superficial inguinal lymph nodes, they are going to drain the scrotum, the lower two thirds of the vagina and the rectum below the dentate line. The deep inguinal is going to drain the D, i.e. the deep inguinal drains the glands penis. The external iliac, that is going to drain the upper one third of the vagina as well as the cervix. So you can make a mental model for yourself, lower two thirds, upper one third, cervix, superficial inguinal, and then eventually into the external iliac. The upper one third of the vagina and the cervix, they're gonna be external iliac. Now they drain into the common iliac and what else drains into the common iliac? Well, the internal iliac. So the internal iliac, that is going to be the rectum above the dentate line. And then you have the prostate as well, because those are those internal structures. So external iliac, internal iliac, they drain into the common iliac. The common iliac then drains into the paraaortic. And remember, the paraaortic lymph nodes are where directly your gonadal pathologies are going to drain into. So I hope this helped, but what I want you to recognize are certain embryological integrations, certain oncological associations, certain infectious etiologies as well. Let's go through this question. A patient is found to have anal cancer. What is the most likely direct lymph drainage point of this tumor? A, external iliac, B, superficial inguinal, C, paraaortic, or D, internal iliac? What do you think is the answer? So remember that the anus is going to be below the dentate line. And if it is going to be below the dentate line, you got it, it is going to be the superficial inguinal. As you can see, when you're talking about superficial inguinal, that's below the dentate line, it's ectoderm. So it's maybe a superficial structure and it's going to drain into the superficial inguinal. 